one. All right, you guys, we're going to do some notes on the regulation of the cell cycle. And there's a lot of chemical signals that go into this. We're only going to talk about a couple. So we're going to have to think about the cell cycle, I mean, cell signaling, um, when you take the notes and think about this. So remember, there's lots of chemical signals, which we call ligands, and we're just going to discuss a couple of those. I'm going to do some scripted stuff and some not scripted stuff. So what controls the cell cycle? Well, there's a reasonable hypothesis back in the day that each event in the cell cycle leads to the next. In the early 1970s, a variety of experiments suggested an alternative hypothesis. The cell cycle is driven by specific signaling molecules present in the cytoplasm. These and other experiments demonstrated that the events of the cell cycle are directed by a cell cycle control system, a cyclically operating set of molecules in the cell that both triggers and coordinates key events in the cell cycle. We've talked a little bit about cell cycle checkpoints, but we're going to go into those a little bit more. Many signals registered at the checkpoints come from cellular surveillance mechanisms. These signals report whether crucial cellular processes that should have occurred by that point have in fact been completed correctly, and thus whether or not the cell cycle should proceed. For many cells, the G1 checkpoint, dubbed the restriction point, seems to be the most important. If it does not receive a go-ahead signal at that point, it will exit the cell cycle, switching into a non-dividing state called the G0 phase. Most cells of the human body are actually in the G0 phase. Mature nerve cells and muscle cells never divide. Other cells, such as liver cells, can be called back to the cell cycle by external cues, such as growth factors released during injury. So here's just a little graphic. If it gets the green light, it goes ahead and proceeds to the next step. If it doesn't, it goes into the G0. <clears throat> Fluctuations in molecules pace these events of the cell cycle, and many of these are proteins. Rhythmic, fluctu <laughs> sorry, rhythmic fluctuations in the abundance and activity of the cell cycle control molecules, pace the sequential events of the cell cycle. Some are protein kinases, which are enzymes that activate or inactivate other proteins. Particular protein kinases give the go-ahead signals at the G1 and G2 checkpoints. The kinases that drive the cell cycle are actually present at a constant concentration in the growing cell, but much of the time they are in an inactive form. To be active, some of these kinases must be, must be attached to a cyclin, another protein that gets its name from its cyclically fluctuating concentrations in the cell. Because of this requirement, these kinases are called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. The activity of the CDK rises and falls with changes in the concentration of its cyclin partner. So in order for this kinase to be active, it's got to be attached to another protein called a cyclin, and then it makes this complex that we call the CDK. And again, another little graphic just to show the fluctuation. Notice that MPF, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, when it's at its highest, then it can continue in on through the cell cycle. MPF is one example of a CDK. Now, don't get bogged down in the letters. Remember, the CDK is just this complex of things that help control the cell cycle. And MPF is just one specific example that we're going to talk about. So MPF stands for maturation promoting factor, but we can think of it as the M phase promoting factor because it triggers the cell's passage past G2 into M. When cyclins that accumulate during G2 associate with CDK molecules, the resulting MPF complex initiates mitosis. So this particular one this complex will initiate mitosis by activating a bunch of other proteins 
that then make this process happen. Again, here's another little graphic. So we've got, you look at it, you've got CDK and cyclin coming together. Then it's MPF that triggers the cell cycle to proceed into mitosis, causing nuclear division. CDK stays constant, and the cyclin kind of just degrades and goes away. And then it's just a continuous cycle of accumulation of the cyclin and CDK making this happen. The fluctuating activities of different CDK complexes are of major importance in controlling the cell cycle. Now, in addition to the G1 and G2 checkpoints, there are some additional internal and external checkpoints that control cell division. Um, for instance, one internal checkpoint happens at anaphase. So just to remind you, let's look at some vocabulary. You've got the centromere, which is holding the two chromatids together. Sticking out of that are the kinetochore microtubules. That's where the spindle fibers attach. Anaphase does not begin until all the chromosomes are properly attached to the spindle at the metaphase plate. The gatekeeper is the emphase checkpoint, and it ensures that daughter cells do not end up with missing or extra chromosomes. Researchers have learned that a signal that delays anaphase originates in the kinetochores that are not attached to the spindle fibers. So if those spindle fibers aren't attached to the kinetochores, it's a no-go. In addition to internal factors, there are external things or outside of the cell that helps control cell division. Researchers have identified many external factors, both chemical and physical, that can influence cell division. For example, cells fail to divide if an essential nutrient is left out of culture medium. Even if all other conditions are favorable, most types of mammalian cells divide in culture only if the growth medium includes specific growth factors. A growth factor is a protein released by certain cells that stimulates other cells to divide. One of those is PDGF. So here's what's happened. Um, they've taken a sample of cells cut it up and they put it into um, this matrix thing in that jar and they have some, they have two samples without PDGF and some with PDGF and clearly they don't grow unless they have these growth factors. So here's the stuff on PDGF. Now remember this is just one example of a type of growth factor. PDGF stands for platelet-derived growth factors, and they're made by blood cell fragments called platelets. It is, PDGF is required for the division of fibroblasts in culture. In culture, we mean we're growing them outside of the body. And so they've done these experiments to prove that this happens and they've got to have this growth factor. These connective tissues have PDGF receptors on their plasma membranes. The binding of the PDGF molecule to the receptors tr triggers a signal that leads to the stimulation of fibroblast division. Fibroblasts are just a kind of a connective tissue that help hold all the other tissues and organs in place. So the binding of these receptors stimulates fibroblast division. And you're like, so who cares? Well, that's because when an injury occurs, these platelets release this PDGF or growth factor in the vicinity, which results in the proliferation of fibroblasts, creating new cells, which then help heal a wound. The discovery of growth factors provided the key to understanding density-dependent inhibition, a phenomenon in which crowded cells stop dividing. So you'll notice in the graphic, you've got some cells dividing, and then they reach like their max thing, and they're all touching each other. And then by step three, we scoop some out, and then they fill in that spot, and then they again quit dividing. So crowded cells stop dividing. <clears throat> 
Most animal cells also exhibit